These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Its continuing mission to explore strange new worlds. This is the introduction to one of the most inspirational science fiction shows ever made, Star Trek. In many ways, the crew of the Enterprise envisioned the outcome of our technology today, like the smartphone, iPad, Google Glass, or Skype. But for me as a scientist, the coolest gadget was this tricorder. This magical device could perform non-invasive, real-time measurements, diagnostical tools, and even environmental scans. For me, this was fascinating. This is how it looked like. How cool was that? More importantly, how could this really work? Because all the other tech gadgets in Star Trek worked. Of course, today we have a number of non-invasive tools available, like an MRI scan or ultrasound. But at least in the 21st century, all of these technologies and instruments, they are really big and expensive. One possibility that this tricorder could really work is by smelling, by sniffing, just like a dog, for example, can sniff the disease in the exhaled breath of a patient. And this, on a more serious note, is the topic of my talk today. I want to take you on a voyage to boldly build a tricorder. But in order to do that, we need a thorough understanding about biology, chemistry, electronics, and physics. So let's get started with biology. As you might know, we have five senses. But only three of them have been commercialized and even combined into one product. The important thing about this one is the form factor. Think about it. This is how a five megabyte hard drive looked 60 years ago. And this is what we have today. More than 200,000 times the storage capacity on the size of a coin. Form factor is important. In contrast to that, still today we don't have a technical device that deserves the name smell sensor because it's so difficult. And one of the reasons why it's so difficult is instead of dealing with mechano or photoreceptors, which are quite easy to mimic technologically, we need chemoreceptors in order to realize that. And you can think about a chemoreceptor just like a molecular translator. It translates the information which is contained in the older molecules, like structure, functional groups, size, shape, and so on, and converts that into bytes and bits and electronic signals. And these signals can later then be interpreted by your brain and basically tells you or tells a medical tricorder what it smells. So the, the very first concept that I introduced here is the concept of merging the world of biology with electronics. I will refer to this in the future as bioelectronics. But now let's take a, a step back and, and try to understand what smelling really is. So when you smell something, you inhale small odorant molecules. These are molecules that are in the gas phase and they are sucked in through your nose and there they travel to the so-called nasal cavity where they are then transferred into an aqueous environment called the mucosa. The mucosa actually contains the specific olfactory cells, like these chemoreceptors from before. And upon proper recognition, an electronic signal is then generated and travels to your brain. In, the, in your brain, these specific patterns of signals are then deciphered and tells you what you're smelling. For this amazing discovery, Richard Axel and Linda Buck received the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2004. But there's more to it. Let's take a look at what happens on the molecular level to really understand what's going on. As I mentioned before, these odorant molecules are in the gas phase, but somehow they need to go to this receptor, which sits right here. The receptor is embedded in a solid structure, a membrane structure, which is surrounded by liquid environment. It turns out that these odor molecules don't really like to go into the aqueous environment. We call them hydrophobic. But nature came up with an ingenious way to solve that problem. There are some proteins called odor and binding proteins, and they act as shuttle mechanisms or shuttle tools to uh, transfer the odor to the receptor. Once the ligand hits the receptor, an amplification cascade is triggered that eventually leads to the opening of a so-called ion channel. Once this ion channel is open, uh, sodium and calcium ions diffuse through the membrane and a charge is accumulating. And this charge accumulation causes a so-called action potential spike. These were these little flashes from before. 
Now, one more step of complexity is the so-called combinatorial code. This is basically the mechanism of how biology copes with this complexity and how it analyzes these patterns, these emerging patterns. You have to understand that we only have about 300 different olfactory receptors, but with those, we're able to differentiate about 50,000 different odors and smells. And an odor molecule has different features like size and chemical functional groups. And so each of them can interact with a number of different olfactory receptors. And because an odor is never composed out of just one uh, molecule, you, you generate basically a smell pattern. And you can see this very nicely in this illustration. These are images from the antennal lobe of a honeybee. And you don't really have to understand what's going on, but you see that there is some, some, some different areas are lighting up, some different activities are going on. And basically, you can think of this like a QR code and that you can basically scan with your smartphone. And your brain translates this information into a smell. To put that into perspective, all this complexity, think of it like this. When you touch or hear something, your mechanoreceptors in your body essentially are detecting one parameter, which is pressure or mechanical force. When you see something, the photoreceptors in your eyes are detecting wavelengths. But when you smell, you need to be able to differentiate thousands of different molecules of size, structure, functional groups, and so on. And to give you an idea about a little more chemical um, approach in, in, inside, this is the uh, so-called ester group. And this molecule right here, this is largely responsible for the smell of an apple. If we add one more carbon atom, it smells completely different. It smells like a pineapple. And notice, the only difference is this one carbon atom indicated by this black line. Yet you can differentiate that. And there are many more examples like pears, bananas, peaches, and so on. But all of them share this one functional group. In chemistry, however, there is not just one functional group. Actually, there are many functional groups. Alkenes, aldehydes, esters, carboxylic acids, amines, thiols, and so on. There are a number of functional groups. For some of them, you can attribute a certain category of smell, like petrol, amines, thiols, and so on. But, as I said before, an odor, a smell, is never compo composed out of just one aroma or one compound. It's a huge mixture. Now, we chemists know about 75 million different uh, chemical compounds, so there's a huge parameter space that we need to cover. What we can now do is take a look at some more physical approaches towards uh, creating a smell sensor. Spectroscopy is a very useful tool, and it works like this. When you excite a molecule with a part of the electromagnetic spectrum, like the IR, the molecule will absorb some of its energy based upon the functional groups um, that it's made up. And the result is a so-called IR spectra. This is a very useful tool. Mass spectrometry, on the other hand, uses a different principle. When you have a charged particle, like an ion, this ion can move along a straight path if it's not interrupted. However, if you apply a magnetic field, the path will become deflected. Now, you can analyze now a lot of different compounds according to their mass to charge ratio, and it's very useful. However, all these devices, these instruments, are really big, so nothing that you can really um, put in a handheld device. Fortunately, there is another principle called a chemical resistor, and it works very simply. You have two electrodes, and if you apply a voltage between the two of them, the electrons will move through this conductive material in between. Now, if you apply an odor molecule, and the odor molecule interacts with the surface, you change the conductivity. We have actually made a demonstration like this. Um, we call it dollar sensor, and it was made in a collaboration with Professor Kimisis from Columbia University. It works like this. You basically plug it into your smartphone, and now when I breathe on it, the, the chemicals, or at least the, the, the water in my breath, is kind of changing the materials and the, and the conductivity of the materials. So that's, that's a very useful tool, but um, it's not enough. We, we lack specificity, okay? Fortunately, there's another concept um, from the combinatorial code. So we can not only just take one of these sensors, but we can uh, take an array of these sensors and functionalize each one of them with a different material. 
In that way, we have a proof of principle that our artificial nose is kind of working. Now, still, even with this more sophisticated approach, we are not there yet and we cannot it, um, compete with Mother Nature. Now we turn to, to this concept um, of biomimetics. This is basically the imitation of model systems and elements of Mother Nature for the purpose of uh, solving very complex systems. Just like winglets of birds are used in aerospace industry or shark skin technology is used to reduce drags for ships and swimmers or this famous lotus effect which is used for generating self-cleaning surfaces. We use this approach of biomimetics for smell sensing. And now going back to what I talked before, we, we use these odorant binding proteins. And let's take a look at what happens when one of these odor molecules interacts with the protein you see that there is a conformational change going on. The structure of this molecule is changing. Now, that is very useful because when we apply this as a transduction mechanism on our transistors, we basically generate a translation between biology and electronics. Upon the conformational change which is happening on the surface, the conductivity of the material below changes and we have our molecular translator from before. That's a very nice principle. And we are not using any material, we are using this famous graphene material because it's actually the thinnest, strongest and lightest material on Earth. And on top of it, it's also biocompatible and semiconducting. It turns out the graphene actually is made up only of one atomic layer of carbon. So it's a two-dimensional surface essentially and the electrons are traveling in between. When anything happen is, uh, is happening on the surface, you generate this signal that we've seen before. Still, this is not enough. And you might ask, why are you using the odor and binding protein when all the heavy lifting is actually done by the receptor? And that's a very good point. But it turns out this receptor is only stable when it's embedded in an artificial membrane. And it turns out that it's really, really difficult to make such artificial membranes and to um, functionalize them with some receptors. But at least for us, this is the holy grail of smell sensing. And this is our ongoing research. Because there is one more aspect to this biomimetic uh, approach. There is a signal amplification in place. So when one ligand binds to the receptor, it generates about 1,000 cyclic AMP molecules. And this leads to the opening of the ion channels. So about 10 million ions per second diffuse through the membrane. This largely speeds up the signal processing, and this is a very crucial aspect about that. Now, there's one more challenge that we have to face. I call it the three-phase challenge, because we need to interface three phases in our technical device. A gas phase, a liquid phase, and a solid phase. And more importantly, we need to combine a very complex biological, meaning aqueous system, with electronics. Of course, you can say, wait a minute, there are um, waterproof electronics. And that's true. But they are only waterproof because you keep the water outside. In our case, it's crucial that we need to interface electronics with water. And that's a whole different story. Now, does anybody know what that is? That is the very first picture of a transistor. This is the core of our technology today. And it was made in 1947. And back at that time, it was neither powerful, efficient, or anything else. But it was a new concept, a new design that allowed scientists to play around, to understand and to learn about this concept. And the rest is history. 70 years and a few hundred billion dollars later, we have 30 billion transistors on the size of a fingertip. And that changed the world. Now, I'd like to say, or I hope, that we're in a similar turning point with our smell research. And someday we can transform some of our concepts and technology to create something as amazing as this medical tricorder, to create all these amazing applications like medical diagnostics, portable food quality control devices, or environmental monitors, right? And to end with, with the catchphrase from my favorite character, Spock, smell is fascinating. Thank you. <laughs>